So one of the questions on the last panel was, what are the use cases for Bitcoin that cash um, that you can't use cash for currently? And that's basically, uh, as Catherine said, our our panel. Um, one of the big use cases for for Bitcoin that really helped uh, propel it into uh, kind of like uh, public sphere and gave it value was its use on Silk Road, um, a uh, online marketplace for buying. Uh, whatever kind of uh, drug you could imagine. I think that's how Gawker uh, d described it when they first introduced the wider world to it. Um, it also had uh, kind of hacking exploits that you could buy there. Uh, so Bitcoin has been, you know, it, it's useful for, for buying drugs. Most recently, more recently, um, after the Target credit cards were hacked, um, the stolen credit card information was available on marketplaces for Bitcoin. Uh, and Litecoin, um, as well as th Western Union money transfers. Uh, so our panel is going to talk about the, the dark side of Bitcoin. Um, we have kind of two people on the legal uh, former policy side, and then two people that are technologists. Um, Matt is very, very much a technologist uh, on the end from Johns Hopkins. Um, then we have Chip and we have Jim, who were with the Department of Treasury, uh, you know, fighting, fighting financial crimes and creating policy to help present it, prevent it. Uh, and then we have Jason, who's with Thomson Reuters and um, is doing a lot of reports on these kinds of tools. Uh, so hopefully we can shed some light on the dark side of, of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Uh, so I wanted to start by saying, you know, Silk Road got taken down. Uh, we're hearing all the time right now about um, Bitcoin crimes that are being prosecuted, uh, some uh, high volume Bitcoin exchangers in Florida who are allegedly violating uh, anti-money laundering laws in the state. Um, the instant CEO and a Silk Road money exchanger were just taken down. Is the dark web as scary as it's been presented or you know, are, is law enforcement on top of it? And Chip, I'm gonna, or uh, Jim, I'm gonna have you start with that one. Uh, that's uh, not an easy one to start with, but I guess <laughs> in, in context, the very aspect of what we're hearing in, in terms of law enforcement investigations and instances of uh, illicit activity are, are in part a representative of the fact that more people are using Bitcoin. Any way that you can move funds or intermediate value is something that can be abused by criminals. And uh, it is a struggle by law enforcement to keep on top of, much less get ahead of those types of usage of any means of value intermediation. But some of the aspects that uh, really tie into Bitcoin and pose additional challenges are, of course, first the aspect in commerce moving into the internet age, right? Were it not for the fact that more people are shopping online, you wouldn't have as much demand as you have for ways to move funds online. It's moved away from the physical connection between people. So all the kinds of ways that you can move money in electronic form are more attractive than ever before. But, but some of the, the fundamental characteristics of Bitcoin also pose challenge. One, of course, is that it's not bound by a jurisdiction. The other is that it's not uh, run through traditionally very heavily, aided, heavily regulated financial institutions. The financial industry is one of the most closely regulated of many different components. And a fundamental aspect of that is being a, a gatekeeper. Right? That's why there, there's so much focus on entities like Mt. Gox. If Bitcoin ever has success, it has to build from more of a niche, the same way that your MetroCard um, only operates in a, a very limited uh, circle. In other places like Hong Kong, the Oyster Card has opened up to all kinds of local uh, commerce within Hong Kong, but that's because it is accepted in other arenas. There's ways to get funds in and out. Um, that's why the exchangers are so important there. But again, one of the other fundamental characteristics of Bitcoin, the fact that there's no name associated with the payment, that's actually a fundamental premise of what is required and has been a major push in financial regulation and efforts to fight money laundering and in particular terrorism, that you must include the name of the originator and the beneficiary of that payment, something that's very different when we talk about 
anonymity in that context is very different from the concept of traceability. But that's a big difference for law enforcement in following the money. It seems like a lot of the exchanges have um, kind of, uh, it seems like they are scared of regulators. Um, exchanges uh, have started asking for identification. Mt. Gox did after the um, after Department of Homeland Security cracked down on them here. I mean, is it still a big? Is that still a big problem? Um, are we starting to solve that that gateway issue? And are people becoming identified as they're coming into the Bitcoin, in into the Bitcoin uh, world? It's still somewhat ad hoc, right? We we don't have significant gatekeepers here. We don't have exchangers here in the United States subject to that same framework. We do have them evolving in some more established jurisdictions, but we still have significant reliance on those in jurisdictions in which there really is no oversight. So how do we know that there's consistency, comfort, the way that uh, supervisory expectations would be for any other provider of financial services? That's not yet developed uh, into a modern way with Bitcoin. Uh, and Jason, can you talk about, uh, <laughs> I lost my, my thing. <laughs> Jason, could you talk about um, uh, beyond that? So there's the, the problem of just people getting into Bitcoin and we don't know who they are. Um, what about once you're in Bitcoin, what can you do to further anonymize um, your activity? So this is, this is an interesting question because, um, you know, before uh, the advent of, of uh, digital currencies, real advent of, of decentralized digital currencies and um, this idea of, uh, anonymizing software like Tor. Um, I never knew how to buy a kilo of cocaine <laughs> before these things came ab about. <laughs> and um, I, I'm, I, I literally entered the workforce right off the farm and you know I, I, I didn't have much of a um, exposure to you know drugs and that kind of stuff growing up and welcome to DC, welcome to DC right? <laughs> and um, uh, so I, I get involved in some of this, this online activity and I look at, at the time when I first started my career, it was IRC, it was Internet Relay Chat, which was kind of the Internet Underground at the time. And, and you know, that was kind of esoteric and, and then all of a sudden I, I discovered Tor and I discovered um, at the time Liberty Reserve, it wasn't Bitcoin. And um, the ability for me to then purchase illicit material, you know, you, I read an article recently um, written by a writer at the Daily Dot uh, about the gentrification of crime and how it's moving from you know kind of off the streets and into our living rooms and it's being off crime is now kind of like software as a service it's kind of like crime as a service now and we can use whatever the digital currency is it's bitcoin at the moment right if you go to silk road it's bitcoin if you go to other and by the way there's a lot of focus on silk road but there's a lot of other hidden marketplaces um, out on on darknet and um, you know, I've seen a lot of things for sale beyond just drugs, right? I've seen weapons. Jerry talked earlier about, um, you know, the, the biggest, maybe potentially reputational risk um, to digital currencies is somebody buys a machine gun and goes out and kills somebody. Um, you know, there are a lot of really hardcore things that are for sale in these hidden markets that, you know, kind of get hidden or kind of get talked about in these, these conversations, but we don't really spend a lot of time thinking about them. You know, I've seen, I've seen major weapon systems for sale. I've seen people. Right, there's a child exploitation issue here that we need to think about. Are you um, seeing Bitcoin as the not always, on these right? It, it's it's dependent. So sometimes you'll see perfect money will show up. Um, what's the one out of Russia? Web 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 money. Um, so it just depends on on what the particular activity is. But the fact that I can do this with little, I mean, we talk about how it's tec technically complicated, but it really isn't. And and the fact that I can do this in my you know, with little kind of expertise in how to navigate this system means that we're probably going to see a, a, and not to be sensationalist, but we're probably going to see an increase in these types of situations that present more complicated problems for law enforcement. I don't know that I answered your question, but, but I think at the end of the day, um, we got problems and we got to figure out how to deal with them. Um, and Matt, I'm going to hop over to you because um, you have something, Bitcoin already has kind of uh, these pseudonymous uh, properties, but you actually don't think that that goes far enough to protect people's privacy when they're when they're using it. So, so I became involved with Bitcoin uh, maybe three years ago now. Uh, it was kind of amazing to us as academics in the field of cryptography. You know, we had been trying for years our our community to build something like this, and nobody had succeeded. And then this anonymous person comes along and builds Bitcoin, and it works. And it's amazing to us, and we're just staggered by the fact that this does work. 
But there's one place that it, we, we kind of figure it doesn't work. There was one corner that Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he is, cut when he built the system, and that was the privacy uh, aspect. Ultimately, what Bitcoin is is a decentralized ledger of who gave what money to which other person. Uh, this information is shared by everybody. There's no concept of a trusted bank. It's not even a question of, for example, you know, do I care that the bank or law enforcement can cap capture my records? It's can my neighbors see what I'm spending? Can my friends see the money I'm spending? Now, Bitcoin does have this uh, pseudonymous property where you can essentially say, well, I'm just a number. Nobody should be able to trace me, but that doesn't work very well. Um, and, and the one last thing I'll say here is that even for Satoshi Nakamoto, he's now, or she, is now the victim of uh, his own success because he's worth maybe several hundred million dollars, which if he wants to stay anonymous, he can't touch. So now there's this, um, there's this problem. You know, how, how, do we, how do we fix this? How do we make the currency a little bit more private? So we came up with a system that uses more advanced cryptography to essentially take the Bitcoin ledger and add very, very strong untraceability to the currency. It's called ZeroCoin. Uh, we actually have a, a first paper that came out last year in a security conference, another one that's coming out this year. Uh, it really is Bitcoin, just minus the fact that you can tell who's spending what and you can't tell who they're spending it or how much they're spending. Um, which brings us, and leads there's us. Nobody, there's nobody <coughs> that would know that. Even zero even people running zero coin couldn't see that part of it. Exactly. If I pay you money, the only people who know anything at the end of that transaction are myself and, and you. Uh, that leads us to a problem, uh, which is that you know, we think this is a very important technology. We think it's a, it's a good thing. It can be built. It should be built. But then again, what are the consequences of building this? And, and I'm talking about consequences here, not just for the world, but also for me. Uh, I'm a little bit afraid at any moment somebody's going to come kick down <laughs> my door when we release this software. Um, I don't know what the law is here. Uh, I don't know if this is you know, something that's going to facilitate crime or if it's going to facilitate privacy. Um, I guess you know, I, what we've learned this year is that maybe we don't have as much privacy as we thought we did. And this is my way of, of doing something. To, to repair that. So Chip and Jim, I mean, Matt is about to bring us something that makes Bitcoin even more obscure and harder to scrutinize. How do you think policymakers are going to react to that? Great question. Uh, thank you, Kashmir. And let me, let me just start by uh, thanking you and telling you and everybody how excited I am to be a part of this. I am without a doubt the most ignorant Bitcoin person in this room, uh, <laughs> which means I'm getting the most value out of this, out of this <laughs> afternoon because I'm, I'm learning a ton of, of uh, of, of information about how Bitcoin works. But um, I did have a heads up on this question, so I, and I appreciate that, uh, where you get the test in, in advance of the, you get the answers in advance of the test, it always helps. Um, but the answer's changed a bit as I've been here this afternoon. And I think uh, the right answer is that the, the policy perspective is essential in thinking through what is the reaction gonna be. So we've heard from different people just from the past hour that I've been here about the attributes of a Bitcoin, which are undeniable, and the economic development and the efficiency gains and the, the, the value add that the technology brings, those are undeniable attributes of the technology as I understand it. Um, we've also heard uh, the privacy concerns about, well, what exactly uh, are we putting out there and who can see it? And those are important questions. Jim's outlined um, in a thumbnail that could take uh, a much longer uh, discussion to really flesh out what are the public policy interests from an illicit finance perspective, and that's in many respects the focus of the panel. Um, the good news is, or I, I suppose the, the tough news is that these interests are, are challenging ones for all the reasons that people are raising, and I would argue are ones that cannot be solved through uh, a unilateral approach for the very reasons that people are celebrating the universality of Bitcoin. It's going to take a globalized approach to effectively deal with this. Um, but the good news is that we've had, I think, practice at this. And we've had um, the ability to um, address these sorts of questions with different technologies that are, that are treading on the same issues. And in many respects, Bitcoin is one form of a new payment mechanism in the way that it's being used now. And that is to say the functionality of Bitcoin as a payment uh, transfer mechanism is a functionality that policymakers across the spectrum of technology, economic development, um, growth, and anti-money laundering and counterless of finance have seen. 
And we've seen this with the mobile wallets associated with whether it's phones or prepaid cards or internet-based payment systems that don't necessarily include virtual currencies because, of course, you can get um, uh, the internet to function as a, as a medium for payment settlement with fiat currencies. So there, there's plenty of, 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 I suppose, precedent in thinking about these issues from, uh, sort of a, a thematic perspective. I think what's interesting about Bitcoin is that um, some of the, the unique attributes of Bitcoin and being a virtual decentralized convertible currency that is gaining um, real credibility very quickly puts in a little bit of a different basket than some of these other um, phenomenons that we've seen in the past. And it's going to raise some interesting questions in the payment transfer uh, field first. And we've seen guidance from FinCEN last year that was very helpful in beginning to color that in. I think the more interesting questions lie ahead of us, both with respect to implementing those obligations, how does that actually work in practice? And then maybe most interestingly, what other panelists have alluded to, other functionalities of Bitcoin, which really are, are, are Endless. Endless, right, exactly. And, and that's going to implicate yet another set of, of But of But if Matt brings us a, cur you know, a, a currency that allows me to send money to somebody else in a way that's not traceable in any way, only that person knows and only that I know, is Matt going to get arrested? <laughs> 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 what do you, Jim, do you, have, do you have thoughts on it? <laughs> Usually they don't go after the developers, um, <laughs> but they, the utilizers. Like the usual. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it might be the people that he hangs out with. So that could be kind of an issue. But um, no, I in a way, th that's the wrong answer. Uh, trying to squelch thinking and development. Clearly, part of the reason why there is so much interest in Bitcoin, as people to uh, have alluded to before, is that the current payment system as it operates doesn't serve the needs of the internet age today, much less in the future. So much more needs to be done in that area. And, and frankly, that, that's not a novel or, or cutting edge proposition. Even the Federal Reserve has said that and they put out an announcement just last week uh, about how they, they weren't pleased with the way the banking system is developing some payments. For the US, for all the aspects where it's cutting edge for us to send transfers the way we still rely on paper checks or, or cash really is second world. Not quite third world, but, but we're certainly far from cutting edge. So that's something that we need to encourage development. We need to encourage uh, inclusive solutions. And frankly, I think one of the best aspects is the competition among different developments. Um, I think that's one of the, the premise we've heard here, but uh, certainly something that I say to people with Bitcoin, Bitcoin may achieve that economy of scale and that successful aspects, but already when Matt's talking about some others, gone beyond some of the aspects that people develop with Bitcoin. And I, I would add to this conversation, I think one of the things that we lack and we've not had a full conversation about is um, ethics and the ethics behind innovation and the ethics behind developing technologies that have consequences that we haven't anticipated. And you see this in other industries. You see this in the biomedical industry. You see this in, um, you, you know, in a, a pharmaceutical industry. Industries where just because we can do something doesn't necessarily mean that we should. And I think from a technological perspective, when we talk about Bitcoin and zero coin and you know some of these other things, you know, have we thought through from a from a innovator perspective whether we should be innovating? Is there is there a need to create a completely private ecosystem that allows for the anonymous transfer of money. Um, I don't know have the answer, but I know that there are consequences from it. And one of them is you can move small or small or large amounts of money to places where people can blow things up. And um, it also means that you know I can buy as much porn on porn.com as I want absolutely. without having anybody know. Absolutely, and I, and, and and I think that's the point, right? The point is. As a culture, we have to come to some conclusion as to what is the, where are the boundaries, if there are any, and if there are, who sets the guidelines, who 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 creates the boundary? Right. And there's a reason. Can I respond to that? If you don't mind, Cashman. Yeah. I um because I apologize. I know I spoke a lot earlier on trying to lay, lay out this framework of different policy interests. As a former policy person in illicit finance, the the, the good news is that. That question has been resound resoundedly answered, been asked and answered. 
where if you were to ask anybody who functionally is operating as a money transmitter over the past really 30 years in the financial system, they have had evolving um, expectations to what are now fairly technical and detailed requirements that are designed to bring financial transparency to uh, the financial system for purposes of effectively protecting that system from illicit finance and turning what is an inherent liability of the financial system prone to criminal abuse into an asset where the authorities that we rely upon to keep us safe can, in effect, take the reliance of criminals on financial services and turn it into an information source and a disruption technique. Now, that, that policy, much as uh, the earlier panel took a poll and said, who knows anything about Bitcoin? I was hiding. I was running for a corner. If I took a poll and said, how many people in the audience are familiar with AML or anti-money laundering or counter-illicit finance regimes? Can I get a, just get a show of, of hands? Okay, so that, that's actually, that's I'm surprised. It's going to be more because we're in a Bitcoin crowd. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> I, I think that's healthy because these are communities of interest where there is, there is, without a doubt, not only compatibility, there is inevitable um, need to integrate all of the interests on the development side, economically and financially, with the counterless of finance community. And that's been done. When I was saying that there are models for that globally and with new payment methods, th that is a precedent that um, unless something disastrously different evolves over the short term, um, that question's been resoundingly asked and answered. So the real issue isn't, whether regulation is coming or whether we should do this. It's really how do we do this in a way that is workable and does not unnecessarily choke innovation at the same time consistent with our philosophy on financial transparency that we rely on for financial governance and to make sure that bad guys aren't exploiting it. That's a how question, not really a weather question. And actually, yeah. you know, just to, for clarification, my weather question wasn't whether we should regulate. My weather question was whether we should be building technologies that um, because we know we can make it completely anonymous, my weather question was whether we should do that. You're basically saying you're not sure about Matt's zero point project. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe do it. don't release it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, this is a question about Bitcoin, right? I mean, you're developing zero coin because Bitcoin is very transparent and traceable in many ways. I mean, it are, is Bitcoin actually a good tool for the dark web? Um, so I mean, some people have, have speculated that, you know, who knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is. If you look at the, the first letters of his two names, you get NSA. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that rumor a few times. Um, so, so the answer to that, a good way to look at the answer to that is there is a gentleman who is currently in jail right now up in New York, and you all know who he is. He's the, uh, the dread pirate Roberts, or allegedly he is, the, uh, Ross Ulbricht, I think is his his name. Um, he is currently in this weird position where he has had 29,000 Bitcoin seized. He is asking for them back. And simultaneously, he's saying that he didn't do anything illegal. Uh, he wasn't involved in Silk Road. So now Just there's an early a, adopter. Uh, exactly. <laughs> one of the first people mining. Now the question is, if we were to look at the history of those Bitcoins, where do they come from? Do they come from Silk Road or do they come from some early adopting you know, mining pool? Well, right now, I think what I've seen so far is the answer is they all seem to come from Silk Road. Now, where did they come from before that? Was they, were they just passed through Silk Road in some innocent way? Uh, but unfortunately, you know, here we have a case where looking at the history of Bitcoin, even a person who had a lot to gain from not having his money tied to Silk Road doesn't seem to have necessarily done that very well if he is guilty. Um, so, so it seems like, yes, it may be possible to use Bitcoin anonymously and safely if you're a criminal, but it's not that easy. Uh, and if you're using a large, you know, moving a large chunk of money, this is going to be a problem for you. Now, the other question, though, is what if you're somebody who is not a criminal? What if you're an activist? What if you are somebody who is donating money to a cause that you don't want to be associated with? I found myself donating some Bitcoin to WikiLeaks this summer, which maybe among some circles is actually not a very good thing to do, but I felt like it was an okay thing at the time. Uh, then I looked at it, I was like, oh my God, I've just linked myself forever to WikiLeaks. What if I want to get a security clearance someday? Uh, there, there is a reason that we want to have some protection. Not going to be possible that zero point problem. Yeah, well, now that's <laughs> exactly. You already got that one. <laughs> They're lost. But, <laughs> but um, you know, they're, they're, uh, anyway, I'm not even sure what the question is, but I do have some, I want to go back to one <laughs> um, Is there really a website called porn.com and do they accept Bitcoins? 
Um, I don't know if it's porn.com, but I know there's one. It might be Pornhub or something. Okay. Not that I would know. Um, <laughs> you notice how no one else answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> so the real question I want to ask you guys is, so which, uh, which dark websites are you using? Um, <laughs> But no, but I mean, how, so there have been these studies that say that Bitcoin is very traceable, that you can see if you're linked to Silk Road. I mean, how, how traceable is it right now? Really, um, really traceable. It's, it's traceable, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it relies on somebody, to, to Matt's point, it, it relies on somebody to make a mistake, right? So you have to acknowledge publicly that your name is associated with that wallet. Having said that, though, I can have 50 wallets, right? I can have 50 different, different um, Bitcoin clients. Um, but you have to rely on somebody making a mistake to find it. So it's very traceable. It's the connection between the account, the wallet, to the person that's the, the key here. And, and, what, and what Matt's, um, with ZeroCoin, is saying, well, let's just break that completely. Yeah. It, and that's the fundamental difference between virtually every other way you can move value in a regulated fashion, that an institution that is closely supervised has to make sure that they are linking the name to the payment and they do that on the basis of some type of ID. That doesn't mean that there's fraud, it doesn't mean that there's mistakes, it doesn't mean that there's errors, but when you're talking about law enforcement who's got more than enough things to do on every day and say that, well, if I had the knowledge, the computer power, the capability and the time that Matt has and as an academic to do with this, I could figure out with some degree of reliability some of these big players. That's a big difference from the guy gave their name, their driver's license number, their social security number, and they said, here's my phone number, call me when the money arrives, and you know they're going to give a real number that's good. So it's pretty easy to pick that person up. That's a big difference. And that's the standard that the CHIPS point has been the global standard applied, the consensus, because it's just too important not to do it that way. So that's how, that's how far off we are. That's a pretty big gap. Yeah. How but, but, but just so that folks are, and I honestly fully agree with Jim on that, um, but I also agree that you know the, the question of privacy is an interesting one because for those of us in the counterless of finance space, we're, we're sort of painted as as these these polar opposites or these the, a zero sum uh, game here, and that's just not it's not really true. It's a little bit more sophisticated than that, which is that there are some interests that um, I think public policy has recognized and legally are um, are codified where privacy is is essential not only for all the, the sort of cultural reasons that we, we, we tend to associate with that, but for the security of an investigation or, or for information flows. So for that reason, I have no <laughs> idea how that happens. <laughs> I'm clearly not a technology person. Um, but uh, for that reason, the information that we glean from the financial system is, is highly, highly sensitive and protected. And there, there's a lot of good reasons for that. So, so privacy is not an anathema to regulation that puts information that we need in the hands of those that we rely on to use it effectively. It's simply a question of what are the privacy interests and what are the compelling policy interests from a law enforcement or a national security perspective and how do we intersect these in a way that the industry can understand because just as Jim said, a law enforcement investigator doesn't have time to to, and, and probably not the skill set to begin to do what you do. The industry doesn't have the time or the skill set to, to, to sort of hash these out in, in, in a literally case-by-case case implementation and execution of policy. They, they, they need guidance, direction, clarity. And I think we're at that point now where that sort of guidance and clarity is everyone's friend in this space at this point. So one of the proposals uh, Ben Lasky mentioned today is when they're thinking about who they'll give out bit licenses to. Um, is that they would ban or restrict the use of tumblers within the Bitcoin system. Uh, and I was just curious for you guys' thoughts on how easy it would be to detect that, to ban that, to keep Bitcoin from moving in, in that direction. Uh, I was just curious about your, your thoughts on the difficulty of that. Jason, you might be a good okay. one for this one. Yeah. Um, so uh, tumblers are, 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 in essence, um, you know, allow for the mixture of bitcoins in a big pool of bitcoins to um, obfuscate the, the uh, traceability, basically. So go a whole That's bunch of bitcoin. That's about as non-technical <laughs> description as I can. A whole bunch of bitcoins go to the same place, get mixed up, and then they go out to different places. Yeah. You can't see that this went from this person to this yeah, person. Yeah, exactly. And, and you would have to have some pretty good um, computing power to, to trace it through. But you could do it, right? 
because ultimately the, there is a public ledger and you could, you could, you could do it. Um, so I, I think it, it, it causes problems when we're, when we're talking about um, hiding the trail of money and it wouldn't be different than uh, any other money laundering type of situation where folks are attempting to cover or obfuscate or complicate the transaction um, history um, in a normal cash um, based money laundering system. Um, so it, it would add complexity to uh, investigating agencies attempting to track the money, but it's not unsolvable, right? Um, and, and I think that, um, to the earlier discussion, I think they're concerned that it, it would take too much time, energy, and effort to go through those tumblers uh, or to track Bitcoins through those tumblers in an effort to, to trace the money. I think we're at the 15 minute mark, so we want to take some questions from the audience. Um, I'll just start with, where is the, the microphone right now? Is it near the front or near the back? <laughs> Do we still have a microphone? Oh, okay. Um, I'll just start with, that. we've got one here and then the second row and then the back. Just a quick question, John Villasenor from Brookings and UCLA. This is a question for Matt. Um, is the computational burden of zero coin something that you anticipate would be an impediment to adoption or not? So it's pretty fast. Uh, the new version that we have is a little bit slower than Bitcoin itself. So it's, you know, Bitcoin's already having trouble scaling up to kind of visa loads. Mm -hmm. So it might cause a problem there, but it's not that much slower. So. Okay, this Carter Doherty with Bloomberg. This points to a need for a, uh, a, a a lesson in basic cryptography, which is something I've uh, started in on and we spoke about on the phone. Um, one of the things that was uh, very revealing to me about my initial under learning about cryptography was that when you come up with a new kind of protocol for encrypting something, you don't actually start using it right away. You sort of throw it out there and let other people smack it down and fiddle with it and see if they can break it, sort of like testing out a new lock. Um, to what, how great is the certitude among professional cryptographers that the Bitcoin protocol and perhaps even your own zero coin protocol have been sufficiently smacked around that we can we can have a high degree of confidence in them? This is something that I've. I think it's safe to say I've never gotten an explanation in English. I've gotten an explanation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the easiest way to answer that question is um, what you do is you come up with a new protocol, you take it, you put it out there. You get a bunch of crazy people to invest their own money in it until each Bitcoin is worth, you know, a thousand bucks or something insane like that. And then you see if the protocol breaks. And nobody has ever done that in the history of cryptography until this last several years. And so if you'd asked me four or five years ago, would Bitcoin work? I would have laughed and I would have said, ah, it's going to be totally broken. But it hasn't. It's been put to the probably the biggest pen test that any security system has ever been put through in history because there's so much money at stake. If there's anything broken, you will benefit hugely from breaking it. And so I think right now the verdict is that this is a, a solution that works very well. Uh, it's not the way I would choose to deploy every security system, but this just happens to be a good way to do it. And they do, f they do find breaks, right? And then they do occasionally this or that. Yeah, and there's this new thing evolved. about selfish mining possibly being a problem. But these are kind of, nobody's, nobody's broken it in a very fundamental way yet. Um, we had a question in the very back. Hi, um, my name is Joe Peck. I'm a lawyer and a Bitcoin enthusiast. Um, I've been paying attention a little bit to some of the stuff that the chief scientist uh, Gavin Andreessen is doing with the next, um, I guess it would be the next version of the Bitcoin protocol or the next updated version. And I've heard some stories saying that they might scrap the, the Bitcoin addresses or the public key addresses to give an opportunity for it to be a little bit more um, uh, voluntarily uh, n not anonymous per se, mm. and you're talking about zero coin. And I, d I just wonder if it had an interesting possibility for this sort of bifurcation of the way you look at anonymous coins versus more voluntary transactions that are less anonymous, and what you guys might think about a situation where there was those two worlds. <laughs> um, um, uh, you know, the, um, I, I think that you should go all the way. I know that the Bitcoin people have been trying to, I'll answer this very quickly, trying to come up with patches to make Bitcoin more private. 
Uh, but the Bitcoin Foundation has a lot of other incentives too. They're trying to be friendly to regulators. They're trying to do, you know, so, so it's, and so they're not doing everything they could to make the, the protocol private. Um, and I think that the motivations there are not entirely technical. I don't believe in these kind of half measures. I think we should go all the way, but it's definitely an improvement. Sorry, so you're running all around the microphone. So um, I'm seeing two very different paradigms of the Bitcoin network coming out. One, that it's completely anonymous. One, that it is way too transparent. It's like having your bank account on, on view for everybody, for the public to see. And you know your reactions, the regulatory reactions and the reactions of the community, depending on which paradigm you believe, are very different. So if you believe that the tra network is transparent and your bank account is online, then it's absolutely critical that you break that chain so that not every member of the public can see your financial transactions. And if you believe that this is a completely anonymous system, then tying, being able to have a real person on the end of that transaction, having some sort of regulated entity collecting <coughs> that information and, and, and doing record keeping and reporting according to the BSA, also in, in equally important. And, and that would make that more of a pressing issue. Do you think that um, the regulators and the community have a sufficient understanding of the privacy issues at stake? And um, and also the the, the you know, for example the um, DHS um, comment at the Senate hearings was that you know, actually most people most criminals know that you know Bitcoin is not anonymous and so you know it's really the bottom feeders that are still using it for illicit activity. Now, oh, um, do you let's think that there's wait, which, are we at, let's just ask the question. Sorry. Oh yeah. So do you think that there's a sufficient understanding of the nuances between let's say a closed currency versus one that has a public ledger? Um, to be able to address these these very key, key issues of ensuring that you know this is not used for illicit activity, a very important policy goal, and ensuring that people's financial lives are not taken online. Well, I, I can tell you the issue of protecting customer data has been arguably the the biggest single focus in the the past year in the financial industry. It's not a post target issue at the beginning of this year it really was the major regulatory pronouncement, including by Ben Losky, looking at uh, aspects of hacking, loss of data, cyber crime is the term that they talked uh, about a lot. So that is something that, again, on a day-to-day -day basis, aspects of all kinds of procedures to make sure not only are regulated industry protecting people's assets, their funds, and, and that's one of the aspects where once you get into a Tumblr situation, you're moving away from an online storage of an, an algorithm to something more like, well, I'll just give you all my cash, and I'm not ever getting that dollar bill back. I'm just getting the equivalent. So actually, I'm taking a credit risk mm -hmm. on you. That's fundamentally changing the way the intermediation mm -hmm. of value has happened. But that is a, a very critical aspect and fundamental one that is of the highest importance for the regulators. I would just add to that that uh, I do think that sophistication is perhaps better than those that are not part of the regulatory AML, counterless of finance policy community, um, understand. And at the same time, it's evolving, right? So um, when I talked about prototypes and precedents and new payment methods, particularly when we look at um, phones and prepaid cards and internet-based payment systems, all of which preceded B B Bitcoin, and address the functionality of Bitcoin as a unit of value transfer. That expertise that was honed through that experience is being applied and considered in the context of virtual currencies. And, and I think the FinCEN guidance from last year demonstrates a, a, a very good understanding of some of these challenges. I also think they're going to evolve and, and point to two um, sort of pathways to watch. One is the implementation of that guidance from March of 2013, how, how is it that exchangers are going to start recognizing their responsibilities under the BSA as money transmitters and um, their ability to win the confidence of the market? Um, and then secondly, as the functionality of Bitcoin begins to expand into some of the uses that we were hearing about on the other panels, it will raise interesting regulatory questions that I don't think have had the same sort of precedence when you look at either functioning as an exchange or potentially um, an investment vehicle or um, a storage of value. It starts to run into some, some novel questions that we've seen in the terrestrial world, but we haven't really seen so much in the virtual one. And, and that will be interesting. 
I'll, I'll actually add to this too because I, I think it depends on your audience in terms of the nuances. So my, grand, my father has no clue the difference between the two. Neither does my niece. And um, until you can get to a, a level of understanding at that particular um, uh, granularity, I think whatever the digital currency is, whether it's Bitcoin or something else, I think you're always going to have problems um, moving forward and, and, ex and expecting acceptance of, of the currency because it's just not, it's not easily explainable. And the nuance between what's private and anonymous and pseudonymous, it's lost on most people. When I was um, living on Bitcoin, all these restaurants would have a static QR code for scanning um, so I could pay them. And they didn't realize that by using the same QR code every time they were making their Bitcoin sales public. All I had to do was go and search that address and I could see exactly uh, how many people had paid them and how much. And I, they were you know, early adopters, but they didn't necessarily understand the technology. Got a question over here? The entire discussion, uh, much of the previous panel, was really focusing on Bitcoin, big, big B Bitcoin, the, the means of payment, uh, you know, the, pa the payment system. They could be delivering dollars just as well as little b Bitcoin. Do you think it makes a difference, or why do you think it makes a difference to some people uh, that this interesting public ledger, peer-to-peer -peer technology uh, rather than being used to transmit an established currency like the dollar, uh, why is it so much more exciting to have this fiat currency with no backing, no anything, uh, terribly volatile? What's the attraction of that? It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. It's cool. I, I don't know that there's any other. I mean, it's it's. And back up. I mean, I think there are some. The remittance conversation is a is a legitimate reason um, why this why this is important. Um, but I mean, it, it's a new innovative way to transact business, and I think most of us expect it to expect technology to help us in our lives, right? To make things simpler, faster, cheaper, and this is just a new way to get at that. To get at that. I think. I think. Well, I think different audiences would answer your, yeah. you know, every panel would have a very different answer to that yeah, question. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it can be about transaction fees for merchants. And it can be about, you know, not having to go through existing um, uh, payment methods like, uh, you know, WikiLeaks accepted Bitcoin after PayPal and Visa and other credit cards refused to process payments for them. So it's about kind of circumventing the existing financial system. Uh, but I think there are, you know, we could have a whole panel on that. Um, but, but fundamental, your point about why aren't they just interested in this as a transmission mechanism for dollars, like, what are we talking about? It's not a transition, a transmission mechanism for dollars, because the dollars is nothing other than, as I said a, a minute ago, your claim on that guy to pay you, right? So you're taking credit risk on that entity. It's, it's inevitable, this is an easy prediction to make, that some pseudo virtual currency, some product, is going to go under and you're going to see it was another Ponzi scheme, the whole currency, not just individuals in it. And all these people who thought they had funds in a virtual wallet, it just evaporates into nothing. The reason why consumers don't worry about that in dollars is because we have deposit insurance for banks going back to the Great Depression, right? In the financial crisis, in the wholesale realm, people didn't rely on that. That doesn't exist it, for the interbank markets. Once you get into real money, then people actually do care about the credit risk behind it. That's where going from a niche product and when you talk about some larger merchants, it's one thing to say that I'll accept currency in Bitcoin, but then they gotta spend it somewhere. They gotta get that value out, right? If their employees take the currency, that's good. If they're just building up a marketplace, then they're reliant on the exchangers, which as we said, is one of the weak links in the system or a developing link in the system. It's very different from saying, oh, I'm attaching money and actually moving dollars. That does not exist. But it, it really depends on the functionality, again, because if, it, if it's being used as a, as a value transfer mechanism, then in many respects, those risks that Jim is talking about are, are, are minimized, marginalized, um, or at least temporarily very, very restrained. The minute that it becomes a unit of savings, it's a very different issue. And, and I think these are, th this, these are the regulatory questions that are going to be interesting because we really haven't answered those in the new payment space when you have basically a depository alternative 
that is not called a banking product. Well, it's functioning, functioning as a banking product. It doesn't have FDIC insurance, and it, it doesn't have any of the, the sort of safety and soundness and supervision associated with that. What do we do then? That's an interesting question, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll see some activism in that if Bitcoin moves down that road. And you may see it in the states before you see it at a federal level. So yeah, it'll be interesting. We time for one more short question. Back here. Hi, Wonjinu. Um, I'm uh, curious to hear the panel's view on whether the continued use of Bitcoins for illicit purposes and perhaps an unforeseen technical vulnerability in Bitcoins could potentially threaten the widespread adoption of Bitcoins and perhaps the, you know, f I guess, future success of, of Bitcoins. Is Bitcoin going to continue to be the currency of uh, the, dark, the dark side, the dark web? But there's no question you have some legitimate players who worry about the risk, the reputational risk of dealing in, in Bitcoins. But there's no question that that is a hampering aspect. That doesn't impact all people, but it certainly does impact the broad um, acceptance. I'll say, I'll say I don't know about Bitcoin, but I'll certainly um, acknowledge that some digital currency will continue to, to pose problems. <coughs> Zero coin. <laughs> 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 It'll be something. No, I, I, I to the to the technical question. I think that Bitcoin really, there could be a disaster, but some technology like Bitcoin will continue to be exist to to exist, and it will continue to grow. I think this is the future. My only comment on that is that you, while regulatory clarity is at this point constructive and, in my view, needed, um, the industry doesn't necessarily have to wait, and leadership in this space from industry is mm -hmm. essential. So conferences like these that begin to band together those that want to protect the reputation and the credibility of the market in an emerging product like this. These are essential events because if it's not as if the, the, the practices that, that the policymakers are looking for are secret. It's the Bank Secrecy Act. It's implementation of financial sanctions. It's, this is something you could, you could hire, you know, we hire you back in your old job and get you to come in and advise on this. Um, but the industry um, to the extent that it waits on this, is not taking the opportunity to define the space from a regulatory perspective in a way that makes lawmakers comfortable. And you know, that's always a gamble, right? And, and you can see this debate in the banking space right now when it comes to issues, whether it's the BSA or IEPA or prudential oversight. You, know, you can wait on the back foot and let others try to figure it out, but then you get what you get. Or you can take a more proactive approach, as several in this room and in the industry are doing, which is to engage the lawmakers and the regulators and say, These, this is educating you about the constructive functionality of the product and some of the safeguards that we think can work. That's the right approach to take. And, and obviously, we're seeing it. So, mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, guys. I hope we shed some sunlight on the dark web. <laughs> <laughs>